A pretty common request I see people make is to have me look at a fund called the Guggenheim Strategic Opportunities Fund, which is ticker symbol GOF. I think there's two reasons why I get this specific fund requested on a consistent basis. First off, as we're about to see, there's a lot of really attractive things about this fund that specifically income investors will love. The second reason is that I think a lot of people don't really have a good understanding of what closed-end funds or CEFs are. In some ways, they're kind of like ETFs, but they're also kind of like mutual funds at the same time. But the reality is they're pretty different from both. So today we're going to talk about closed-end funds and more specifically about ticker symbol GOF and determine if this fund is a good investment for you. So the Guggenheim Strategic Opportunities Fund is a closed-end fund issued by the Guggenheim Partners, which is a large investment company founded by the Guggenheim family who made a fortune in the mining industry in the early 20th century. According to their website, GOF's investment objective is to maximize total return through a combination of current income and capital appreciation. The fund will pursue a relatively value-based investment philosophy, which utilizes quantitative and qualitative analysis to seek and identify securities. The fund seeks to combine a credit-managed fixed income portfolio with access to a diversified pool of alternative investments and equity strategies. Just by looking at the surface, we can see this fund currently offers investors an awesome 13.28% dividend yield according to Google, and this fund does pay investors on a monthly basis. If we expand the share price performance of GOF, we can see that this fund has basically flatlined since its inception. It was launched in 2007 right before the financial crisis, whereas you can see it did take a massive nosedive. But it eventually recovered and soared higher than its IPO price. Since August of 2021, this fund has continued downward, where it's now trading at $16.46 per share. Looking at this fund's dividend distribution history, we can see that in its 15-year history, it's never reduced their dividend. It hasn't been increased since 2013, but the fact that they've been able to maintain this dividend this long is pretty much unmatched by the majority of closed-end funds I've come across, especially anything offering a yield of over 12%. But in my opinion, I think a lot of people just don't have a good understanding of what closed-end funds are or how to properly analyze them. There aren't too many people here on YouTube who regularly like to talk about CEFs. You have some people who talk down about them because closed-end funds typically don't offer high dividend growth and they do charge higher fees on average. So they come to the conclusion that closed-end funds are a bad investment for all people no matter their preferences or life circumstances. And then you do have some people who actually like to invest in closed-end funds, but they tend to view them as, I don't really understand how they work or how they generate dividends, but I'm just going to put my faith in the company and that they know what they're doing. Here's a chart that I presented a few times on my channel before that the people over at Hoya Capital made. You can see how closed-end funds compare with ETFs in your typical open-end mutual fund, like what Vanguard and Edward Jones offer to consumers. They're all diversified investments that hold a collection of stocks, bonds, or both. But what sets CEFs apart is that they use leverage in order to boost returns on their holdings. They're also actively managed, which means that people hand-select everything that goes into them. This results in CEFs charging higher expense ratios than the other two investment types. There's also a fixed amount of shares of a closed-end fund, whereas with ETFs and mutual funds, they can change their shares depending on the demand. This is a really important thing for ticker symbol GOF, which I'll get into later in this video. But closed-end funds are usually most ideal for people pursuing an income investing strategy. Because GOF has gone almost a decade without raising their dividend, and the share price tends to swing between $15 and $25 per share, it's obvious that if you're looking for growth, you're only experiencing that by reinvesting the dividends or using the dividend money to buy other holdings in your portfolio. But as I always like to say on my channel, if this is your personal preference when it comes to investing, don't let others give you crap about it. If you're not retired and you want to invest in closed-end funds for those dividend payments, then go ahead and do what you want to do. I'm personally motivated by high dividend payments, which is why I personally like closed-end funds. And if you're the same, then don't let others criticize you for it. But getting back to GOF, let's look at some specifics about this fund and try to determine what we can expect in the future. On Guggenheim's website, they break down what exactly is in this fund. As of June 30th of this year, we can see 91.41% of this fund is made up of fixed income securities. Breaking that down, we can see the three largest concentrations in their portfolio are high-yield corporate bonds, bank loans, and ABSs, otherwise known as asset-backed securities. These three categories easily make up the majority of this fund's assets at 81.53%. Asset-backed securities are basically pools of loans like mortgages, auto loans, and credit card receivables that represent contractual obligations to pay. All three of these investments tend to come under a lot of pressure during rougher economic conditions. If we look at the credit quality of their debt, we can see it holds mostly B-rated debt. 7.99% of their debt is unrated, so it's kind of a mystery as to what this is. This fund's debt portfolio is actually better than another holding we looked at a couple of weeks ago, which was OFS Credit Company. Just like GOF, OCCI invests primarily in debt, and while that fund does offer a higher dividend yield, it's significantly riskier than GOF's debt portfolio. 
but OCCI is a CLO fund, whereas CLOs only make up a very small portion of GOF's portfolio. But now I want to draw attention to some really important things I found about this fund, which does make it a lot riskier than some other closed-end funds I've come across. There's two important numbers you need to take a look at when you're analyzing the performance of a CEF, which are the share price and the net asset value. It's a unique feature of closed-end funds that ETFs and mutual funds don't share in the exact same way. The share price is whatever the market determines to be based off the demand of investors, but the NAV is the value of all the assets divided by the number of shares outstanding. It basically helps tell you what the value of all the assets are inside of the closed-end fund. If a fund has a decreasing NAV, it's a pretty good indicator that what's ever inside the fund might be losing value. If we look at the share price and the NAV for GOF, we can see that since 2013 this fund's NAV has been falling. Whenever the NAV goes down for an investment holding debt, it's usually followed by decreases in dividend distributions. For example, I know they're not closed-end funds, but business development companies and mortgage REITs have NAVs too, and when their NAVs fall considerably, then dividend cuts pretty much always follow. To give you an example, Annaly Capital is a mortgage REIT that invests in mortgages, and as their net asset value drops due to losses on their debt, then they're forced to cut their dividends, which is what we've been seeing for about a decade now. The same can be said for business development companies, which hold corporate debt instead of mortgages. So this really did lead to a great mystery to me. How on earth is GOF able to sustain their dividend distribution despite an eroding NAV? After doing some digging in their 2021 annual report, I think I found how this fund's been able to keep its dividend. It's a long document, but if you scroll down all the way on page 97, you'll see something pretty shocking. Between 2020 and 2021, this fund issued a massive amount of additional shares, a little over 9 million of them. I have no doubt that they've probably continued to issue even more shares since this report came out. Issuing additional shares like this is something that only closed-end funds do. ETFs and mutual funds don't have this same process. If you're wondering what the significance of this is, this is probably how the fund has been able to keep its dividend at the same rate from what I was able to find. GOF has been creating tons of new shares of this fund, and they've been selling the shares at the current market price. I suspect what the company is doing is they're taking the money that they're getting from issuing these new shares, and they're probably using the proceeds to keep paying the same dividend amount each month. This would show that what's currently inside of GOF isn't performing well enough to pay that $0.18 cent per month dividend, and they need some additional help with that. So that's definitely bad news. From what I'm seeing, if this fund stopped issuing all of these additional shares, it wouldn't be able to afford the dividend, and a cut would be necessary from what I'm seeing. But does that mean that GOF is doomed? Not necessarily. I want to make a couple of points for your consideration. First, even if a moderate dividend cut were to happen, remember it's still yielding over 13%. Even if a dramatic cut were to happen, like let's say if it was reduced by a third, you'd still be looking at a dividend yield of nearly 9%, which is still great. Secondly, I don't know if this strategy is what they used back in 2008. In 2008, which was a worse time compared to right now, this fund suffered horribly and its NAV crashed pretty dramatically, but it did eventually recover. It would take a lot of digging and research to try to determine that information. I've seen some people make the argument that this fund has been through worse times than right now, which is true, but given the current market conditions, the general consensus seems to be that things are going to get worse. I've personally never owned shares of GOF, but I keep it on my watch list because if this fund does recover, then I will be interested. I remember coming across GOF years ago, but at the time I saw the share price had been falling for a while, so I figure I'd come back to it and take another look at it down the road. That was a few years ago, and it's still been slowly falling as time goes on. I've seen people who own thousands of shares of GOF, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't sleep so well at night if I owned that many shares and didn't have a well-diversified portfolio. Given what we've looked at, if you choose to pursue GOF, I'd strongly encourage you not to overinvest in it and make sure that you have a whole host of other income-producing stocks and funds in your portfolio. Because right now, I just view it more as being a speculative investment.